everyone i'm back with charlotte's web um today we're going to read chapters 17 and 18. chapter 17 is called uncle when they pulled into the fairgrounds they could hear music and see the ferris wheel turning in the sky they could smell the dust of the new of the racetrack where the spring sprinkling cart had moistened it and they could smell hamburgers frying and see balloons aloft they could hear sheep blatting in their pens, and an enormous voice over the loudspeaker said, Attention, please. Will the owner of a Pontiac car, license number H2439, please move your car away from the fireworks shed? Can I have some money, asked Fern. Can I too, asked Avery. I'm going to win a doll by spinning a wheel, and it will stop at the right number, said Fern. And I'm going to steer a jet plane and make it bump into another one. Can I have a balloon? asked Fern. Can I have a frozen custard and a cheeseburger and raspberry soda? asked Avery. You children, be quiet until we get this pig unloaded, said Mrs. Arable. Let's let the children go off by themselves, said Mr. Arable. The fair only comes once a year. Mr. Arable gave Fern two quarters and two dimes. He gave Avery five dimes and four nickels. Now run along, he said, and remember, the money has to last all day. Don't spend it all the first few minutes. And be back here at the truck at noontime so we can all have lunch together. And don't eat a lot of stuff that's going to make you sick to your stomach. And if you go on those swings, said Mrs. Arable, you hang on tight. You hang on very tight. You hear me? And don't get lost, said Mrs. Zuckerman. And don't get dirty. And don't get overheated, said their mother. Watch out for pickpocketers, cautioned their father. And don't cross the racetrack when the horses are coming, said Mrs. Zuckerman. The children grabbed each other by the hand and danced off in the direction of the merry-go-round toward the wonderful music and the wonderful adventure and the wonderful excitement into the wonderful midway where there would be no parents to guard them and guide them where they could be happy and free and do as they pleased. Mrs. Arbel stood quietly and watched them go. Then she sighed. Then she blew her nose. Do you really think it's all right, she asked. Well, they gotta grow up sometime, said Mr. Arbel. An affair is a good place to start, I guess. Looks like a fun fair, huh? While Wilbur was being unloaded and taken out of his crate and into his new pig pen, the crowds gathered. They wanted to watch, and they stared at the sign that said, Suckerman's famous pig. Wilbur steered back and tried to look extra good. He was pleased with his new home. The pen was grassy, and it was shaded by, from the sun by a shed roof. Charlotte, watching her chance, scrambled out of the, out of the crate and climbed to a post under the side of the roof, and nobody noticed her. Templeton, not wishing to come out in broad daylight, stayed quietly under the straw at the bottom of the crate. And Mr. Zuckerman, he poured some skim milk into Wilbur's trough. He pitched clean straw into his pen. And he and Mrs. Zuckerman and the Arables walked away toward the cattle barn to look at purebred cows and to see the sights. Mr. Zuckerman particularly wanted to look at tractors, and Mrs. Zuckerman wanted to see the deep freezer. Lurvy wandered off by himself, hoping to meet friends and have some fun on the midway. As soon as the people were gone, Charlotte spoke to Wilbur. It's a good thing you can't see what I see, she said. What do you see? asked Wilbur. There's a pig in the next pen, and he's enormous. I'm afraid he's much bigger than you are. Maybe he's older than I am, and he had more time to grow, said Wilbur, tears coming to his eyes. I'll drop down and take a closer look, Charlotte said. She crawled along the beam until she was directly over the next pen. She let herself down in a drag line until she hung in the air just in front of the big pig's snout. May I have your name, she asked. The pig just stared at her. No name, he said in a big voice. Just call me Uncle. Very well, Uncle, said Charlotte. What's the date of your birth? Are you a spring pig? Sure, I'm a spring pig, replied Uncle. Would you think I was a spring chicken? Ha, ha, that's a good one, huh, sister? Mildly funny, said Charlotte. I've heard funnier ones, though. Glad to have met you. Now I must be going. 
She ascended slowly and returned to Wilbur's pen. He claims he's a spring pig, said Charlotte, and perhaps he is. One thing is certain, he has the most unattractive personality. He is too familiar, too noisy, and he cracks weak jokes. Also, he's not anywhere near as clean as you are, nor as pleasant. I took quite a dislike to him in our brief interview. He's going to be a hard pig to beat, though, Wilbur, on account of his size and his weight. But with me helping you, it'll get done. And here's a picture of that pig. See? He's really big. He's not as cute as Wilbur, though. When are you going to spin your web, asked Wilbur. This afternoon, late, if I'm not too tired, she said. Charlotte, the least... The least thing tires me these days. I don't just, I just don't have the energy I once had. I guess it's my age. Wilbur looked at his friend. She looked rather swollen and she seemed listless. I'm sorry to hear you're feeling poorly, Charlotte, he said. Perhaps if you spin a web and catch a couple flies, you'll feel better. Perhaps, she said. But I feel like the end of a long day, clinging upside down to the ceiling. She settled down for a nap leaving Wilbur very much worried. All morning, people wandered past Wilbur's cage. Dozens and dozens of strangers stopped to stare at him and admire his silky white coat, his curly tail, and his t kind and radiant expression. Then they'd move on to the next pen where the bigger pig lay, and Wilbur heard several people make favorable remarks about Uncle's great size. He couldn't help overhearing these remarks, and he couldn't help worrying. And now with Charlotte not fearing, feeling very well, he thought, oh dear. All morning, Templeton slept quietly under the straw. The day grew fiercely hot, and at noon the Zuckermans and Arbles returned to the pig pen. A few minutes later, Fern and Avery showed up. Fern had a monkey doll in her arms and was eating Cracker Jack. Avery had a balloon tied to his ear and was chewing a candied apple. The children were hot and dirty. Isn't it hot? said Mrs. Zuckerman. It's terribly hot, said Mrs. Arable, fanning herself with the advertisement of the deep freezer. One by one, they climbed into the truck and opened the lunch boxes. The sun beat down on everything and nobody really seemed hungry. When are the judges going to decide about Wilbur? asked Mrs. Zuckerman. Not till tomorrow, said Mr. Zuckerman. Lurvy appeared, carrying an Indian blanket that he had won. That's just what we need, said Avery, a blanket. Of course it is, said Lurvy, and he spread the blanket across the sideboards of the truck, so it was like a little tent. And then the children sat in the shade under the blanket and felt better. After lunch, they stretched out and fell asleep. Chapter 18 is called The Cool of the Evening. In the cool of the evening, when shadows darkened the fairgrounds, Templeton crept from the crate and looked around. Wilbur laid sleeping in the straw, and Charlotte was building a web. Templeton's keen nose detected many fine smells in the air. The rat was hungry and thirsty and decided to go exploring without saying anything to anybody. He started off. Bring me back a word, Charlotte called after him. I shall be writing tonight for the last time. The rat mumbled something to himself and disappeared into the shadows. He didn't like being treated like a messenger boy. After the heat of the day, the evening came as a welcome relief to all. The Ferris wheel was lighted up now. It went round and round in the sky and it seemed twice as high as by day. There were lights in the midway and you could hear the crackle of the gambling machines and the music of the merry-go-round and the voice of the man in the Beano booth calling numbers. The children felt very refreshed from their nap. Fern met her friend Henry Fussy and he invited her to ride with him in the Ferris wheel. He even bought a ticket for her so it didn't cost her anything. When Mrs. Arable happened to look up into the starry sky and saw her little daughter sitting with Henry Fussy and going higher and higher in the air and saw how happy Fern looked, she just shook her head. My, my, she said, Henry Fussy. Just think of that. Templeton kept out of sight. In the tall grass behind the cattle barn, he found a folded newspaper, and inside it were the leftovers from somebody's lunch, 
a deviled ham sandwich, a piece of Swiss cheese, part of a hard-boiled egg, and the core of a wormy apple. The rat crawled in and he ate everything. Then he tore a word out of the paper, rolled it up, and started back to Wilbur's pen. Charlotte had her web almost finished when Templeton returned, carrying the newspaper clipping. She had left a space in the middle of the web, and at this hour no people were around the pig pen, so the rat and the spider and the pig were by themselves. I hope you brought a good word, Charlotte said. It's the last word I shall ever write. Here, said Templeton, unrolling the paper. What does it say, asked Charlotte. You have to read it for me. It says humble, replied the rat. Humble, said Charlotte. Humble has two meanings. It means not proud, and it means near the ground. That's Wilbur all over. He's not proud, and he's near the ground. Well, I hope you're satisfied, sneered the rat. I'm not going to spend my time fetching and carrying. I came to the fair to enjoy myself, not to deliver papers. You've been very helpful, Charlotte said. Run along if you want to see more of the fair. The rat grinned. I'm going to make a night of it, he said. The old sheep was right. This fair is a rat's paradise. What eating, what drinking, and everywhere. Good hiding, good hunting. Bye-bye, my humble Wilbur. Fare thee well, Charlotte, you old schemer. This will be the, a night to remember in a rat's life. And he vanished into the shadows. Charlotte went back to her work. It was quite dark now, and in the distance fireworks began going off. Rockets scattering fireballs in the sky. And by the time that the Arbles and Suckermans and Lurvy returned from the grandstand, Charlotte had finished her web. The word humble was woven neatly in the center. Nobody noticed it in the darkness. Everyone was tired and so happy. Fern and Avery climbed into the truck and laid down. They pulled the Indian blanket over them. Lurvy gave Wilbur a fork full of fresh straw. Mr. Arbel patted him. Time for us to go home, he said to the pig. We'll see you tomorrow. The grown-ups climbed slowly into the truck, and Wilbur heard the engine start, and he heard the truck move away at a low speed. He would have felt very lonely and homesick had Charlotte not been with him. He never felt lonely when she was near, and in the distance he could still hear the music of the merry-go-round. And he was dropping off, as he was dropping off to sleep, he spoke to Charlotte. Sing me that song again about the dung in the dark. Oh, not tonight, she said. I'm too tired. Where are you, asked Wilbur. I can't see you. Are you on your web? I'm back here, she answered, up in this back corner. Why aren't you on your web, asked Wilbur. You almost never leave your web. I've left it tonight, she said. Wilbur closed his eyes. Charlotte, do you really think Zuckerman will let me live and not kill me when the cold weather comes? Do you really think so? Of course, said Charlotte. You're a famous pig, and you're a good pig, and tomorrow you will probably win a prize. The whole world will hear about you. Zuckerman will be proud and happy to own such a pig. You have nothing to fear, Wilbur, nothing to worry about. Maybe you'll live forever, who knows? But now, go to sleep. For a while, there was no sound. Then Wilbur's voice. What are you doing up there, Charlotte? Oh, I'm just making something, she said. Making something as usual. Is it something for me, asked Wilbur. No, said Charlotte, it's something for me, for a change. Tell me what it is, begged Wilbur. I'll tell you in the morning, she said. And when the first light comes into the sky, and the sparrows stir, and the cows rattle their chains, when the rooster crows and the stars fade, when early cars whisper along the highway, you look up here and I'll show you something. I'm going to show you my masterpiece. Before she finished the sentence, Wilbur was asleep. She could tell by the sound of his breathing that he was sleeping peacefully deep in the straw. Miles away at the Arbel's house, the men sat around the kitchen table eating a dish of canned peaches and talking over the events of the day. Upstairs, Avery was already in bed and asleep, and Mrs. Arbel was tucking Fern in. Did you have a good time at the fair, she asked as she kissed her daughter. Fern nodded. I had the best time I have ever had anywhere or any time in my whole life. Well, said Mrs. Arbel, isn't that nice. And that's the end for tonight. So I hope you sleep well and we'll pick this up again tomorrow night. Good night kids.